Mike Lang. Okay. All right, let's get started. Good evening, it's seven o'clock and I'd like to open the December 3rd, 2020 school committee meeting. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom. The town of Lilton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19th, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Those concerns were supported by the Attorney General's office and confirmed by town council. One concern is that the chat function allows a parallel text conversation to a board's public meeting. Chat is essentially running commentary that is occurring, but is not moderated or followed by the chair. All participants and listeners may not be aware of comments being made because some meeting participants joined by phone do not see these conversations. Another concern is conversations between residents within the chat room, which are not incorporated into the public record. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes, which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the Zoom meeting are set so their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use star six to mute or unmute your phone. So that the meeting can occur in an orderly fashion, we ask the people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please use the raise your hand function available on Zoom, or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. The meeting host will notify the chair of the raised hands and the chair will determine whether and when to allow public comment. When called upon, participants should unmute and state their name and address. After speaking, we request that the participant return their microphone back to mute. All right, so now we got that out of the way. Start the meeting with the consent agenda, the minutes from November 19th, 2020, and oath to bills and payroll. Make a motion to approve the minutes from November 19th, 2020, and oath to bills and payroll. Second. All right, motion made and seconded. Are there any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, hearing none, I'll call for a roll call vote. Timlin? Timlin Rossi, yes, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Brad Hunt, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontanella votes yes as well. All right. We have two uh, sections in the meeting for input from interested citizens, one now and one closer to the end of the meeting. If there are any interested citizens that would like to bring anything up before the school committee, please use the raise your hand function. And Dorothy Malone, our meeting moderator, will get you in front of us. We do have a few. One okay. Matthew Ridge, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Matthew Ridge, 325 Great Road. Um, question is, uh, who or, uh, or what is the uh, requirements for the food that gets sent home with our children? Um, I'm, we're running into an issue here where it's not exactly healthy. Um, one of our uh, last time I sent brought something home, it was powdered donuts and a uh, a sugar drink. I mean, I would say a fruit drink, but it was basically uh, it, it was basically not even from concentrate. It was just basically like a I have no clue what it was. Okay, but basically it's it, it is we've been seeing. Like the cereals are high sugar, the the foods are high sugar, and everything else. I mean, I don't mind having a hyped up kid for excitement for school, but I mean, after school, I don't know about you, but bouncing off the walls aren't exactly indicative to a good classroom. <laughs> Matt, you can reach right out to the principal of the building, and they will put you. They will deal with it themselves, or put you in touch with our food services director, and they will uh, take a look at the situation for you. All right, thank you. Yep. Jen Gold, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Hi, this is Jen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi, Jen Gold. Uh, I'm at 259 Harwood Ave. Um, I'm uh, wanting to talk uh, quickly about, um, an e following up on an email I sent the school committee, um, Superintendent Clinchy and the principals uh, earlier this week. Um, I'd like to propose the suggestion of opening back up the schools um, for our kids to attend on alternating mm -hmm. Wednesdays, um, given the fact 
you stay close. You know that a lot of Jen, Jen. Excuse me, Jen. You're breaking up, Jen. Okay. My question. We can't understand you. I'll I'll dial back in. Okay. We'll we'll, we'll we get you when you come back in, Jen. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I'll dial back right. in. Thanks. Yep. All right. Is there any anybody else who has a comment? All right. We'll keep our eye out for Jen and get her back uh, as soon as she gets dialed back in. But in the meantime, uh, I believe that recognition is next. Dr. Clinchy, do we have anything we want to bring up in terms of recognition? Sure, it's really on the agenda that later on, but I'll, I'll start now. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'd like to thank all the, the families and the staff who filled out the attestation form uh, during the Thanksgiving break. Uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful that this, this is gonna help uh, contain the virus uh, and uh, hopefully keep it out of our schools as much as possible. Time will tell, uh, it's Thursday already. Uh, we're, we're gonna be uh, in a time period pretty soon where uh, we will have, uh, more uh, explicit proof that, that, that this did make a difference. Although there are multiple variables that come to play, but I know uh, we were unique in doing this and, and uh, I'm hoping and, and pretty confident that it will have made a difference, but uh, we still have a few days to wait. All right, great, thank you, Dr. Clunchy. All right, let's give Jen another shot. Okay, Jen, you there? Come on back in. <laughs> Hi, I'm on my phone now, is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, the idea of opening up the schools on Wednesdays um, for alternating Wednesdays for alternating cohorts. So essentially getting cohort A in every other Wednesday and cohort B on the alternating Wednesdays. Um, research has come out over the past few months about the fact that cleaning um, surfaces really has little to no impact on uh, you know, the, on the spread of the virus and um, giving the kids the chance to get back in front of their teachers and with their friends learning in person an extra, two, on average, two days a week each month actually increases their time in school about 25% on average every month, which is pretty significant. And so um, I know, Mike, thank you so much for getting back to me, Mike Fontanella, uh, with, you know, the fact that you guys are considering lots of options um, going into the new year. I wouldn't expect any change like this to happen before the new year, of course, but um, I really would like to strongly propose that you guys suggest this and maybe even bring it up as an agenda topic after the new year. Um, I think it would be a quick and easy, relatively easy, none of this is easy, but a relatively easy way given the infrastructure that's already set up to keep the kids socially distanced, to keep the classes sizes small, but to get those kids that are on the hybrid plan back in the classrooms at you know 25% more of the time um, after the new year. So um, would love any feedback now or just the acknowledgement that you've heard my suggestion and that you will you know, give it some consideration for after the new year. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Uh, we, we have heard it. We appreciate the email. Yours wasn't the only email that we received in that regard. Uh, it is definitely something that we can consider as we uh, take this opportunity now that we're, uh, you know, well into the, the school year to uh, evaluate how things are going and see where there might be opportunities to uh, improve, fix, uh, and, and, and modify how we're doing things. Um, you raised a good issue. The, the Wednesdays were specifically we used for remote only to uh, focus on cleaning. Uh, we can, we're going to ask our uh, staff to let us know uh, how that's being done and what kind of time frames are required to finish doing the work that they do on the Wednesday that's more extensive than they would typically do on a normal day. Um, they do it on Wednesday, but then they do it again during the weekend. Obviously, the weekend doesn't pose as much of an issue in terms of lost opportunity for instruction time, but there may be a way to uh, be assured that they can still get the work done that we're asking for on that Wednesday uh, during non-school hours when you know staff, students and staff would typically be in the building. So we need to get some information on that. Um, and then of course, you know, the health metrics in general are gonna inform you know, our decisions about, you know, do we try to be more aggressive or do we need to be less aggressive, you know, depending on how things go. Um, as Dr. Clenchy mentioned, we're monitoring to see how we do coming back off the holiday break, the first one we've had since we started the hybrid model. So we're going to learn a lot over the next week or so, two weeks, um, and that'll inform us as well. 
uh, in my response to the people who did email, I, we will definitely take a look at a variety of things, but in all likelihood, nothing's going to change prior to us going out for the winter break. And then we'll see what we, we think we might be able to do. There'll definitely be opportunities to put it on the agenda. Any, any specific uh, things that we're considering will be on the agenda. There'll be opportunities for public input. And of course, everyone needs to realize that, you know, whether or not we need to negotiate it with the union, we certainly need to inform them and, and, and get them uh, in the loop on anything that we're su suggesting that we might want to change. So we'll need to do that as well. So we just need some time to go through that whole process and, and uh, there'll be opportunities to keep the public appraised and, and get their input as well. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, I would like to uh, put Mike Lynn on hold for a minute and go down. To, we have two presentations. Uh, let's do the health metrics first. Um, Katrina is here and is, uh, has, has gotten us the latest data and she's willing to present it to us and she doesn't get paid to do this. Mike Lynn gets paid to wait so he can wait. Um, so Katrina is with us. Hi. All right, do you see my screen? Yep. All right, great. Okay, so I hope everyone had a good, restful, quiet Thanksgiving. Um, we have some interesting things on the data, but it, as it was just a holiday week, there's some backlogs and some, the data needs time to catch up. So we'll keep that in mind as we go through everything. Um, so today, this is the mass daily dashboard that DPH puts out um, for today. There were um, over 6,000 cases <laughs> reported today. Um, of that 680 were actually a backlog that were from before December 1st. So this is over 5,000 cases in the last three days that have been um, reported today. So there's also over a thousand or 1300 people in the hospital. Um, the average age of that's actually gone down at 68 now and 49 deaths. And um, actually our testing is taking a little longer to come in, which makes sense given the holiday. So we're, we're into this lovely second wave, if you will, graph um, from the spring. We are at a higher level than we were back in March, um, which was at our peak. And um, this week, the average daily incidence rate for 100,000 and for the last 14 days was 35.7. That is double the rate that we had at the beginning of November. On a, November 5th, it was 15. So we're, we're well above where we were a month ago. Uh, this is the um, last six weeks of cases. So the daily confirmed cases over the last six weeks. And um, we're, we were on a steady rise up until Thanksgiving, which is the 26th right here. So then we've kind of flattened and um, we expected this. This is, this is what happens after a holiday. This is the lack of testing um, access during the holiday weekend and delays in reporting of the data over the holiday weekend. So this happened to be a longer holiday weekend of four days and we're seeing a little bit of a, a slow unrolling of the data now. Um, so we, I expect to see this data rise over the next week. Um, you know, it takes two to three weeks after a holiday to catch up. And so next week we'll be telling of where we are. Uh, this is the percent positivity um, graph. The, um, since Thanksgiving, actually, which is the lowest point, we've just been on an upward trend. Like a, I don't, it's like a mountain that was just rose in front of us. Um, it went from 3.43% to 5.29% for total for everyone. Um, and when you take out the college testing, it's 7.32% um, for everyone else. So again, during the holiday weekend, um, we expect to see these numbers change over the next week as reporting catches up and people um, get tested following any of weekend travels. And then this is the number of testing, like number of tests done each day statewide. Um, and I, this is important. Um, we'd been doing 
like 110,000, a little 105, 110,000 for a few weeks. And then we jumped up in the um, week and a half leading up to Thanksgiving, there was a lot more testing happening, um, particularly three days before Thanksgiving um, was people prepared to gather or travel over Thanksgiving. So the number of tests that happened right before the holiday were at an all time record high. Um, and then followed by a, a, some of our lowest rates of testing in the three days following Thanksgiving. So that holiday weekend. So again, um, the extremely high number of cases that we had reported today was not related to more testing. We actually had less testing. Um, so that's concerning. Um, in addition, I heard a report today that the sewage level of COVID is on its all time high too. So another corollary that we have more COVID circulating in our communities, we have widespread COVID um, community spread. So it's around. So this is the hospitalizations um, and they, you, this was in March and that was our peak. And then we fell down and we'd been doing really well. And then in the last month, we've been on a steady upward trend um, we now see over a thousand hospitalizations a day. And um, this is important. It seems like it's not rising as rapidly as it did last spring, which is good. But um, these cases, the 6,000 cases we had to like reported today, and we had 4,000 cases yesterday. So these high level of cases that we have identified now are going to end up hospitalized. A proportion of them will end up hospitalized um, three to four weeks from now, which is Christmas time. So around Christmas time, we're going to have this, our hospitalization rates are going to, um, will be very different. And um, that's really concerning, actually. Um, so the state op is opening a field hospital in Worcester this weekend. And they also announced they are opening, they're working on opening a field hospital in Lowell. So the fact that those two of the hospitals are, uh, the field hospitals are being located not that far from us when you think about it is, is a concern um, that we have to go there. And there's also a lack of, you can add as many beds as you want to a hospital, but if you don't have staff to staff them that they're not really helpful. So um, I know they were, the governor was putting a plea for people to apply for jobs if you have any medical um, related experience. So again, that's a, this is a concerning thing. Um, and then we're moving on to the, this is the um, age-based data based on the DPHS weekly report from um, today. The cases, the same age groups still are the highest. So everyone less than 60 years of age are the highest groups. Um, you can see everyone kind of flattened this week. And that is because of the impact of the holiday weekend. So again, we have to wait a week to get a better picture of whether um, this is a flattening trend. It's unlikely. It's probably a catch up data reporting trend. I hope I'm wrong. Um, we're going to get into local data now. So this is the, um, these are the thresholds that DPH puts to determine what um, towns are in the red, if you will. I did get confirmation that Littleton is officially in the less than 10,000 population, under 10,000 groups. So we are strictly um, relying on number of cases now. So this is Littleton's number of case graphed, um, graphed over, well, since August. Um, and the black line here, the heavy black line is the date that the thresholds were changed. As you can see, they changed the colored bands of what, um, what our new numbers represent, what color risk estimate we were in, the risk threshold. Um, this is actually our second week in the red. Last week we had 27 cases and this week we have 28 cases. Um, and that was following two lower weeks. So we've had preceding Thanksgiving, we had an influx of cases. And then coming out of it right now, we only have one more, but there's a lag in testing. And um, interestingly, the um, for the attestation form, we people shouldn't have been tested till yesterday, which means they're not actually represented in this data yet. So we'll see how that plays out in a week or so. Let me make sure. Um, so these are the average daily incidence rates per 100,000 that we've been calculating for each of the geographic areas we've been looking at for months now. 
Um, all areas are tracking higher. Um, last week when I did this, every area was either double or triple the rates, but this week that is not true. And simply again, the um, data needs to catch up. So we're still having that delay. But interestingly, Littleton's, um, Littleton's doubled from two weeks ago. We were at 16, not 16, 13, two weeks ago, and now we're at 28. So um, 28 cases, which is a rate of 20.5. Um, so we are in the red again for the second week in a row. So this is when we graph the um, average daily incidence rates per 100,000 for each of those geographic areas. Uh, if you notice, I truncated it. I started it back in September. It was getting too long for the slide. So um, the rates in all the areas, again, we're just, we're, we continue to track higher and we've leveled off this last week, but that's related to the holiday. Um, so remember last time I presented to you two weeks ago, I was cautiously optimistic that our rates, um, that are because our cases had been low for two weeks in a row. And um, that is no longer the case. We're now, we're now back on the upward swing, just like everyone else. But it, I do have to say that whatever we were doing a month ago worked out for us for two weeks because it took our rates from looking like the 495 belt and put us more in line with our border communities, those that touch our border. So we can change the, our trend if we do the right thing. So if we mask and we distance and we reduce the number of people we come in contact with and um, all of those layers of cheese, if we can do those, keep doing those and we can impact our rates going forward. So this is the test positivity um, data. And just like the rates, test positivity has trended higher across all areas. Um, Littleton is now at 3.04%. Um, we've hit that 3% threshold. Um, and total test positivity for the areas, again, I just said was trending higher. But interestingly, in all other areas that we tracked, there was actually less testing happening in the last two week period. And Littleton for the second week in a row has had over 200 additional tests than we typically have had week over week for months. So we've been averaging like 800 tests, um, just over 800 tests a week. And now we're the last two weeks we've had, um, sorry, 800 tests over a two week period. And now this week we've had over a thousand. So, um, and again, this testing data does not include any testing that will happen for people who traveled or um, for the attestation form situation. So that will come out next week. So I guess there's a couple ways to look at this is that people were listening to us and getting tested before Thanksgiving, um, before they gathered and traveled, which would be great, or they're getting tested when they come back, which is also great. Um, or you can look at it that people were traveling and gathering, even though um, that was advised against um, by everyone. So I don't mean to like guilt anyone, but this, this is a good and bad thing, depending on how, what happens over the next week or so. Um, this is the graph of total test positivity. And again, everything is trending higher. You can see Littleton's dip down and then we're now right in line with, um, with our border communities and Middlesex County. But again, everything's trending up. And this leveling off that you're seeing at the end is the holiday impact. Um, so just a few things uh, um, public health wise, um, the state data indicates that um, 17% of cases and 25% of contacts are not, um, the state contact tracers can't get a hold of them. They're not answering the phone or returning phone calls. So please answer the phone if um, somebody, if you get a call and there's no shame, just please, without answering the phone, you can't get help, can't get tested. We're, we're kind of flying blind. So I'm really encouraging people to just track that. And I believe the number should come from either Neshoba um, Associated Health, Board of Health, or it will come from a state, uh, it's labeled as a state um, contact tracer. And then the next thing is the mask order, mask protect others and they protect you and the state mask order is still in effect um, that everyone over five 
um, should be wearing a mask indoors, outdoors, public, anytime you're around someone who's not in your same household that doesn't live with you. And that face coverings are required whenever we're sharing vehicles, which means school pickups. And if someone could, if you have a high schooler who's driving people around, it would be great if you could let them know that that's a law or a order in our state for now. And then um, I, I showed this two weeks ago that um, the bubbles that we had over the summer, the spring and summer are not they're not intact anymore. If people are going to school and work and going to restaurants or the gym or errands outside the house, um, you have an out an exposure outside your house. And so does your, your friends in your bubble. Um, and really we're in a web, like we are in a spider web of connection. So there is no bubble anymore unless you are truly isolating. And so is your bubble. So it's really important that we all practice prevention daily to protect ourselves and protect our community. And then I'm gonna land on the same Swiss cheese side that we always do. So I think we can impact our rates just like we did a month ago when we started really clamping down and we brought our rates back down for two weeks in a row. We can do this again if we're wearing masks and washing our hands and staying distanced um, and doing everything we can to meet people outside and not inside. And um, you guys know what the right things are. We just need to keep doing them so that we can lower our rates back down, keep them in check. And that's it for this week. All right, thank you, Katrina. Um, I wouldn't call it good news, but it's good to have the data. Uh, appreciate you turning around and in rapid order. You're getting to be quite a pro at that. <laughs> I wish it wasn't it. in my skill set. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and so we're starting to expect it. We're gonna be disappointed one week. You're gonna be like, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, so. It's really, I'm. This week is shocking. Today's data was shocking. And I'm really concerned. Like my hopeful, optimistic point of view from two weeks ago is I don't have it anymore. I will be honest. So I really hope people can um, do the right thing for a while. Anybody else have any comments or input for Katrina before we let her go? Brad? Yeah, I really liked optimistic Katrina. Um, two weeks ago, <laughs> it, was, it was it was great to see her. Um, but, um, sobering Katrina is also great to see. Um, but this, these data are, are troubling, uh, you know, as I'm trying to understand it. So total number of cases are five to 6,000 a day is what we're seeing. Higher but, test positivity rates. Um, what else? Um, higher hospitalization. That's a leading indicator, you said. And the only cause for optimism that I'm hearing from you is that we've, we've bent the curve or changed the curve before by um, modifying behaviors. Is that... Is that the takeaway? Yeah, um, the the governor has no plans to change any openings, closings. So we can't expect um, a government order to help us bend our curve. And at this point, the only thing we have is individual responsibility and behaviors that will help us bend our curve and keep our school population and our community safe. So uh, thanks for that, or I don't know, thanks is the right word. Um, you. You've mentioned in the past that most of the clusters seem to be household clusters. I was looking quickly through the report. I don't know how you prepare that report when I couldn't um, make my way all the way through it. But it seems like there, I, as I saw correctly, there have been 69 school clusters. Is that, does that sound about so, right? Yeah. So, Brad, I didn't get to that today um, okay. or before this presentation. But, yes, there have been 69 school clusters. Um, and... I should have prepared for this question. I I'm sorry. Have, no, this is the audience for this question, right? Um, yes. So there, I think there has been 69 school clusters and they've each, the average was like, it changes every week, but um, three to four case, other cases will arise from the first case and more contacts will be involved as well. Um, and I, there is some signals now that from other schools that are reporting some in-school transmission. So what I don't know is what model um, or what layers of protections those schools have put in place to help mm -hmm. lower their risk. So unfortunately, the school data is um, is still needing to be. It's been really messy to me. I mean, I was looking at the category, and it seems all K through 12, private, uh, public. Um, I didn't know if there, if you had any greater clarity or knew anything else. Just the numbers, what I saw. So no, a it's it's one big group right now. Um, the other thing that came out of the governor's um, press conference earlier this week was that they were presenting on clusters, descript a real good description about 
clusters that arose from churches and houses, um, community, faith communities. And um, they dropped a hint that there are other clusters that they're planning to describe soon. And my guess is that school clusters will be part of that. So I'm hoping more data will be forthcoming. Um, but yeah, the number of, um, I briefly looked at the number of cases uh, reported in the DESE data week after week up until before Thanksgiving. Um, and that was on the rise every week for both students and staff. And um, the number of clusters were on the rise and the number of cases in the K-9 clusters, that's from the DPH data that was on the rise. Um, and then I know Littleton has had, I, I've received a few notifications this week about cases um, over the holiday. So hopefully they aren't in the building. But um, I, again, I think it's really, this is a hard area to get find data, public data for. Um, because the I can't quite figure out what the policy is for reporting the data. It doesn't, from what I can tell for DESE, it doesn't, maybe I'm wrong and I'm hoping somebody in this group has more information that it may not be required, it might be voluntary. And then um, it's hard to tell from the state data what's being reported and how that's being captured. And, and so we're still, I feel like we're flying blind a little bit still. Um, so other than just trying to put my nose down to every little bit of data I can find, for this question because it's I think we're gonna come up as we we know we're gonna come up to it so we just had a question about um, more in-person days so I feel like this is an area that it needs work there's no national guidance there's no statewide guidance about reporting and that makes this a little blind thank you again for all your work on this uh, districts uh, have been asked to, to report that data uh, and we've been reminded a number of times, uh, Littleton has been doing it faithfully every time we have a case. So I'm hoping that uh, the data is, is uh, fairly accurate. Uh, what I don't know is how often it's updated at this point in time, but uh, from uh, fellow superintendents that I've talked to, uh, they're all, or we are all taking it very seriously and, and feel that the uh, input of that data is, is a very important part of the whole picture. That's reassuring. <laughs> Um, can I ask a question about what you're asked to report or uh, maybe I can email you later? Sure. That would be, that okay. would, would be good. I mean, I, I can, I can fine. I'm, I'm just curious of, um, well, is it, what is the period of time that, um, you are like, is it a, if the student has been or staff member has been in the building, I know it's just in-person students. Um, and it, whether that if you're reporting it to Desi, is there a period of time that, like a, win a week look back that they've been in the building or is it um, a shorter period? We, uh, we report uh, positive cases right away to, to DESE. And when, okay. when the Department of Health uh, contact tracing uh, team uh, is involved with us, they typically go back uh, two days uh, prior to the formation of symptoms in an individual if they're, if they're symptomatic. So we've been following that. We have been more heavily involved in, in contact tracing, uh, especially this week, uh, to, to make sure that uh, we've done our own due diligence to, to contact or, or make sure that we feel pretty confident within our school community that we've, we've determined uh, how many close contacts, if any, that we have. Our nurses are doing a great job. Uh, our uh, admin assistants uh, in the offices are spending a lot of time on the phone uh, you know, talking to people and the administration is involved as well, so. Okay, thank you. All right, any comments or questions? I do see one hand raised for public input. Dorothy, why don't we go ahead and do you. that? Matthew Ridge, please state your name, your question. Yep, uh, 325 Great Road, Matthew Ridge. Uh, question with the uh, with the numbers, do we actually have age groups or is this just a lump sum? Because right now it's, and I don't mean to sound negative, but if most of these are not uh, younger people or even people under the age of, well, 60, I mean, do we really have to fear this or is this basically a swath and we just don't know what it is? If I may share my screen again, I can show you who's who the cases are. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm assuming you can see the first page again. The graph. Yep. Okay, so. Um, no, um, but, but what I mean is that I know this is Massachusetts. I'm talking about Littleton. Oh, 
Yes. So in Massachusetts, the majority, um, the vast majority of cases are under the age of 60. Um, and the, the zero to 19 age group is the second highest age group. Because of cases. I, not to One be second. negative, but I, 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 hold I on, really, let me finish. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so unfortunately, um, we need to wait until the board of health meeting each week. And that is reviewed at that meeting. And, um, so, and it also depends because we have fewer cases, how much granularity they can um, give us. But personally, I think between the 28 cases and the four letters or three, case, four cases that I was notified by in the, um, from the school this week and the um, number of households being clusters, my guess is these are families, um, families that are like us. Okay, because my my worry right now is that, and because I've seen this myself, is that has anybody talked about the flu? Because it's because my thing is that I have heard that we have had less flu cases than we've had COVID cases, and I don't know if that's true, but it seems to me that we we might be counting one way or the other and not realizing it. Uh, it's just, th that's my worry is that we're putting more hype on COVID than we are the flu because one is more contagious towards people than the other one right now. And I, I'm just afraid that anybody who sneezes, we're going to say they have COVID instead of the flu, which technically the COVID is a version of a more virulent version of the flu, but that's another story altogether. Um, I just, I'm just, I'm just more worried that these numbers are going to put fear into people and not put it into statistics. Actually say that Massachusetts is here. We have 80% of the people here showing that younger people are being affected. If you take the cases we've had here, which are, you said we've had four notices out of 28, that's, my math stinks, but I probably say less than 5% or around 6%. So, I mean, we're, we're not exactly bucking the system, but we're not, we're not Massachusetts. We are Littleton. So we can't take the big number and it can bring it down to little because we have so small amount of population in comparison. So that's part of the reason I do the rates by population and we are right alongside the rest of the population in our state and the, the DPH and the governor's um, point of view is that we are, there's wide community spread and everyone's moving and along the same pathway. So we're all trending upwards. In terms of all the right. flu, I can absolutely understand that the symptoms overlap and um, there's concern about that, but that is, yeah. that's why there's testing and the COVID test is specific for COVID and the flu test is specific for flu. And that's why we have those tests. Oh, so I, I, and I cases understand. are COVID positive cases. Um, right. And so that's I absolutely I'm understand when pre-symptom, like when you have the first symptoms and you need to get tested, that's a concerning time, but these numbers are based on COVID tests. Right. But what I'm saying is that we have 28 cases this week uh, or this, this last running of COVID. How many flu cases do we have? I you know. will be honest, I haven't been tracking that. So we okay. can go to the Board of Health and ask for that number. All right, because I'd like to see that because if they're saying zero, I think there's an issue. Just personally, I think we need to keep this into consideration because I think what's going to end up happening, and you, you don't have to quote me on this, but what's going to end up happening is we are going to start seeing more COVID cases and flu cases at the same time because of the fact that once you become immune compromised, you are going to have a weaker immune system and you're not going to be able to fight one off or the other off. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, we are going to be hitting mid winter and we are going to be in the middle, if not dead center of flu season, which is going to cause COVID to spiral out of control. If we go by the standards we are right now, we are protecting ourselves. We are doing everything we're supposed to. We're still getting it. Now what happens when kids start getting sick and everything else, and all of a sudden a kid comes in with the flu and doesn't even realize it, starts hacking and coughing, gives away the flu, and then somebody comes in 
has been in cont- in content- has COVID or whatever is asymptomatic on COVID but not flu, and we won't know until w- it's already spread. I mean, these are real situations, and we are going to find out. I'm afraid to say the hard way that whatever we do, whatever protections we have, it's not going to be enough. And Matt, it, yeah, thank that's, you, Matthew. That's my worry. Yeah, you're, you're raising some, some definite issues that we all have concern about the, in terms of the presentation of symptoms. And I think people need to be more cognizant than ever. Even, even though you might know it's the flu until you absolutely get tested and know that, if you're presenting symptoms like that, we shouldn't find out when you're at school. That should be determined at home and you stay home and you access, uh, you know, class remotely until families have been able to determine exactly what the problem is. Cause you're right. If we, if we're not all diligent about that, we could get into a situation where we're being much more reactive, which we can't really tolerate. We can't react to this. We have to be active in terms of, uh, holding ourselves accountable individually and as families and as a community to the behaviors that we expect. And we'll continue. We appreciate Katrina definitely lends a lot of lessons to that in her, her presentations and we'll continue to hammer that home. Um, but you're, you're, some of the things you bring up are definitely legitimate issues that we have to watch out for. I would be careful about uh, how we equivocate the flu with the COVID. They are different. They are tested differently. We are not increasing our count of COVID because it's flu season. The, the COVID count is the COVID yes. count. Um, so um, you're right in terms of, you know, we could see an increase in COVID because people are sicker, you're more likely to get sick in this time of year. So that's something that we all have to watch out for uh, just in general, much less related to, to schools. Um, but thank you for, for that input. Mm-hmm. All right, we have one more hand up, Kerry Cusick. Carrie Cusick, your name, your street, and your question, please. Hi, Carrie Cusick, 3 Silver Birch Lane. And just curious, um, with the current positivity rate now over 3%, um, just wondering what the school committee has in place for plans, if we continue at this rate, for what our school model may look like um, with the current hybrid setting, and just if plans, if we ever have to go fully remote, if you've thought about that yet. We're definitely thinking about it. It's something we're keeping an eye on. I mean, right now we feel that the while the numbers are sobering in terms of testing positivity and positive cases, uh, we have not seen a, a direct correlation in terms of the number of cases in schools amongst our students and staff. And we feel that as long as we can keep an eye on that and that stays where we, we want it to be, uh, that we can continue to maintain the current learning model. Having said that, uh, things are not going <laughs> well in terms of increased numbers. Um, but Katrina raised the point right now, the direction from the state is to keep everything the way it is, not just schools, but um, social gatherings, businesses, things like that. So we don't have a particular trigger where we're going to say that's, you know, we hit the trigger and that means we're going out. Um, it's something, it's a, it's a combination of factors. Um, much of it related to the information that Katrina presents to us every week, but uh, also significant look at uh, our infection rates in our school community, our students and staff. Thank you. Just, just a follow up. Are you still working sort of in, hand in hand with the board of health in town around these matters too? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you, Katrina. Appreciate the uh, support. Uh, I think we're good on that for now. We're going to move into our next presentation, which is Mike Glenn, our athletic director, talking about uh, the potential for a winter sports activity. Uh, Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me to present tonight. Um. I do have a slideshow that we'll be pulling up. Uh, whoops. You got to go back a couple slides. Thank you. Um, so on next slide, please. Just a quick, I know I talked to you a few weeks ago about fall, but a uh, quick recap um, of the fall season. You can see there the, the sports that we offered. Uh, football was a practice only sport, but we did have uh, 10 practices. 
Uh, all in all, we had 11 teams going. We had 177 athletes active at the high school. <clears throat> we played 84 contests successfully and had over 250 practices uh, during the fall. Uh, without any incidents, really. Um, next slide, please. Um, we had uh, our varsity field hockey team has had quite a run and uh, felt it was worthy to acknowledge them here in this, uh, that they were a pod seven champions. We, you know, unfortunately this was a team that was probably built for a long tournament run. Uh, they did not get that chance, but they did have an opportunity to uh, win their pod and uh, have the best record during the season. And then also win the pod playoffs. Um, that image you're looking at just so everybody's aware is emerged uh, image created by our yearbook club and um, Mr. Warzex. And uh, it, it's quite a lengthy process, but I'm very thankful that they did it. It's a great keepsake for the kids. We shot every, the way we did uh, our fall team pictures was we shot every kid individually in front of a green screen. And then they were able to create these images. Uh, we did an image like this for every team that we had this fall. And all of those images are available on Twitter. If people are watching right now and they're wondering where's boys varsity soccer and the other sports, um, they're all available on, on my Twitter feed, uh, which is on the, you can look on Twitter or you can look on the, on the athletics website and there's a uh, window there for it too. I'll go to the next slide, please. Okay. So some of these, many of these slides are very similar to the, to the ones that we talked about way back in, um, I guess it was August or it was early September, it was somewhere in that range. Uh, all sports of the youth in scholastic and adult levels must follow the current EEA guidelines, which um, that should be an active link. And uh, maybe it doesn't show in this view, but that sh the, e e the EEA should be a uh, active link where if you click on it, it will bring you to those guidelines. Um, the winter season dates, are 12, 14, 20 to 221. Indoor track has been moved to the fall two season by the MIAA. Sport committees have provided guidelines and modifications for approved winter sports. Leagues should organize into geographic pods, uh, same as we talked about in the fall. And there's no MIA playoffs this winter. So that's state and MIA guidance thus far. Next slide, please. Um, Basketball and ice hockey, MIA modifications, these are two of the hot topic, higher risk team sports that we offer. Um, and their modifications were presented. We, we got them last, um, last week, or I'm sorry, maybe the week before that. Uh, just some, these are very, very basic bullets. Um, these uh, documents are quite in depth and I, there is uh, a link on the PowerPoint, but it's not showing on this, this view for some reason. Um, but face coverings are required at all times. The facility must have a designated mass break area. This was certainly easier to manage outside, but we, we do have a plan for it indoors in our own gym and at the rink. Uh, players and officials must arrive in uniform, ready to play slash officiate, no locker room access. Um, so, you know, this is different from from traditionally where kids and visiting teams would have locker rooms and our officials would be shown to a room and uh, none of those things are going to happen. It's going to be show up ready to go and probably change from boots into sneakers. And um, we're expecting teams and officials to be ready to, to participate right on, right as they arrive. Team benches must maintain social distancing. Um, I know the rink that we play at has a plan for this. I have, done a fair amount of time conceptualizing what our gym will look like. Uh, I do have a plan for our gym as far as how we can maintain social distancing. We, we don't have a large gym. Uh, we have a pretty uh, tight gym and um, some things, and, and Mike's familiar with our gym, obviously. And, uh, you know, some things that we're going to do in our gym, if we end up playing basketball, is we're going to use the bleachers actually as the team, team benches, probably the first several rows with marked spots and every player will have a, a designated spot and they should only return to that, that seat. They should not be sh uh, no shared seats. Um, our scores table will remain on the other side of the gym. 
in order to keep those adults away from the players and players away from those adults. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky, but I think um, logistically we can make it work. Our check-in area will be visible so they can get waved in. If anybody is a basketball person knows what I'm talking about. Um, there'll be no handshake ceremony, be no, um, no starting lineup ceremony. A lot of those things that you're used to seeing uh, in a basketball game will not happen. Players will provide their own water. And please see the MIA basketball and ice hockey rules, modifications, and guidelines documents for details. Like I said, the words basketball and ice hockey are actual active links. Um, so sorry, they're not showing up in this presentation that way, but the presentation that will, I'm sure, be part of the minutes um, will have active links to the MIA guidelines with the word basketball and ice hockey being, being active links. Um, again, these are just very, very um, – large bullet points. There's a lot to these documents and a lot of uh, provisions and guidelines that we've, we're prepared to take in order to play these sports as safely as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, getting into the Midwatch League and MIA District 2 slash 3 actions, more local, more local actions on top of, and these would be in addition to MIA and state um, actions that have already taken place. We are District 3, but District 2 slash 3 are the, basically the Central Mass Districts. We're part of District 3 and obviously a member of the Midwatch League. Uh, we're going to follow all EEA, DESE, MIA, Board of Health, and local district guidelines for athletic participation. Transportation is per DESE guidelines. We're organized into geographic pods of schools rather than divisional alignments, which worked out very well for us in the fall. It was it was geographic, but it was also pretty balanced as far as competition. It will be a shortened season competing against schools within each pod in order to reduce contact transmission. Um, another thing we've done with the, with the winter with basketball is, again, again for contact tracing purposes, we're going to play the same opponent within the same week. Therefore, basketball is a Tuesday, Friday sport. Let's just say our opponent were to be Groton Dunstable. We'd play Groton Dunstable at home on a Tuesday and away on a Friday. We're going to play them essentially back-to-back -back within the same week, whereas you would typically see them on the front end of your schedule and in the back end of your schedule. Um, a, lot of, a lot of districts in, across the state and even in other states have done this. Um, some are doing it in the fall. We did not do this in the fall, but uh, given the higher risk and also going through the process and learning as we go, we did make this decision within our pod that we would – um, pair the games within one week. Littleton's current basketball pod is as follows, Groton Dunstable, Lunenburg, North Middlesex, St. Bernard's, and Tingsboro. Five of those schools were in our fall pod. St. Bernard's has replaced Parker. Um, Parker has opted out of the winter pod, but St. Bernard's has replaced them. So basketball is somewhat similar to the fall pods. Um, as we get into the next slide, you're going to start to see that winter sports are not as simple as fall sports. In the fall, we had essentially one pod across all the sports we offered. That's not possible in the winter because um, there's several sports that are not mid-watch league sports. They're central mass sports because they're more centralized. I mean, more specialized, rather. Uh, boys ice hockey is a prime example. It is not a mid-watch sport it's a central mass sport and that is due to the fact that not as not nearly as many districts have ice hockey as basketball and uh, indoor track and sports of that nature. So ice hockey falls into a different pod and that pod has some similarities to basketball, but, and it's a larger pod. And that was based on uh, hockey is a very unique sport. Um, and we're going to get to also the makeup of our hockey team on a, on a couple slides away, uh, we are a, a co-op program in ice hockey with Bromfield. I'll get to that later on. But our boys' ice hockey pod is Fitchburg, Gardner, Groton, Dunstable, Leminster, Lunenburg, North Middlesex, Oakmont, and St. Bernard's. And with a 10-game season, in hockey, it's a little different. In basketball, we're gonna pl the plan is to play those five other schools twice within the same week. In ice hockey, you would only play each school once, and there'd be two schools that you would play twice. Uh, again, looking at a 10-game schedule for ice hockey. Um, overall, practices can begin on December 14th. 
There was a recommended layoff period. This is not from the MIAA. This is from, uh, this was a league and district level decision from those leadership groups. A recommended layoff period from 1223 to, to January 3rd. And um, that's something that we may, I would think, have dialogue about. I don't know if we would do that at the end of this or, or um, we would do it at this point, but I guess we could probably wait to the end and maybe talk about all questions that school committee members may have. Contest can begin on January 8th. Uh, this is a key bullet. This is not an MIA requirement. It's not a state requirement. This is a Midwatch League decision and District 3 decision. There are no spectators allowed at winter contests. Currently, that is the plan heading into the season. Uh, there has been some pushback to that from parents and uh, even some schools have had pushback, but that is the plan going into the season that no spectators will be allowed at the winter contest given the indoor nature um, of the sports. During the fall, we basically, for the majority of the season, it was two spectators per, per athlete, home only. There was a little bit of a time where we expanded when the numbers were very low and things were going quite smoothly, but then guidelines changed and uh, we went straight back to home only and two, two per athlete. I won't say that some away parents weren't watching from the parking lot, things of that nature. They got creative, but that was the plan. But indoor is a little different. Another um, decision by the Midwatch League in Districts 2 and 3, uh, Midwatch League actually on this one, indoor track can hold 10 practices during the winter season. This will be the same rationale as was applied to football. In those practices, if we decide to move forward with that, would be outdoors only, weather permitting throughout the winter season, most likely on the track or in the parking lot, but 10 practices with no indoor um, access that has already been covered with the coaches if we were to move forward with this, with that bullet. Once again, middle school sports will not be conducted at an interscholastic level this winter. That was the same ruling as the fall um, certainly we have our hands full operating in a scholastic athletics during, during a COVID pandemic, pan pandemic, um, there's a lot of challenges that we don't normally have that have to be, uh, require constant attention and the focus is on varsity and JV sports. Does anybody want to talk about the slides thus far? Or should we just keep going? Mike, do you want to? Go no, just let's finish up, Mike, and then we'll, we'll, we'll ask our questions at the end. Okay, um, next slide, please. Uh, so I've made these points before back in August, but I do think they're worth kind of uh, revisiting. Uh, one thing I think is important to understand for people is that, because I understand there's, there's a level of risk right now, there's a level of risk to everything we're doing in schools and in life in general. Athletics and other co-curriculars are a voluntary privilege. Parents, students, and coaches have the option to participate or opt out, similar to deciding whether you're hybrid or whether you're fully remote. Um, sports, it's an option, and um, parents and students have the option to participate or not. This next bullet is something I didn't mention back in August, and it was something that became profoundly obvious to me during the fall. I mentioned to you the last time I was speaking to the school committee, this fall was probably one of the best at seasons I've ever had as an athletic director. And I think this bullet touches upon why. Participation in athletics right now provides a daily social gathering. And, and that word, that phrase alone is, is somewhat of a uh, alarming, you know, we hear the social gathering, not supposed to do that. But athletics provides a daily social gathering for students under the supervision of a qualified adult with strict guidelines and rule modifications in place. There is nowhere else unless I'm missing something, where our students can do that daily. The, the hybrid plan is two days a week. You know, three days a week, kids are at home. They're on your couch. They're in their, they're in their kitchen, wherever they do their learning. Um, this is the only opportunity for students to get together every day with friends, with teammates, with a coach, and do it in a very, very safe manner, um, as safe as we possibly can. Uh, I do think that's probably the most important bullet on this screen, on this uh, slide. Physical health, obviously, our top priority during this pandemic, but we also must be mindful of their mental and emotional health. I think 
the further we go along, we're seeing pandemic fatigue from a lot of people. I think everybody's probably feeling that. And uh, I do think that another thing I saw vividly during the fall was um, just in general, general happiness of our students, our kids that had the ability to, their, if their sport was offered and they were participating, they were happy to be at practice. They were happy to be doing anything team oriented or social oriented and, and sports now encompasses more than just the sport of basketball, the sport of soccer. It's much more than that. So it's a critical role in the overall health of many of our students. And as we mentioned before, on uh, normal year, we're fortunate to be in the 69% range. We, we won't get that this year because some sports aren't being offered or some kids are opting out, but um, obviously a very large percentage of our student body participates in athletics in a normal year. And obviously we had strong participation in the fall. Okay, next slide, please. Here's where I mentioned that winter sports aren't quite as, a little more complex than fall sports. Boys and girls basketball is a Littleton High School sport, varsity and JV. Um, basketball is a higher risk sport uh, in the current EAA guidelines, but, but obviously has been cleared for, for uh, gameplay. Boys and girls indoor track is a huge participation sport for us on a normal year. We, we usually average in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 participants on indoor track, our indoor track program. It has been postponed by the MIA to the fall two season. Midwatch League voted to allow member schools to hold 10 practices all outdoors during the winter season if we decide to move forward with that. I don't think we'll see that level of participation if we move forward, but I do think we'll see a a solid group of students who are indoor track kids. Um, and the, the reason why indoor track, if anybody's wondering, because indoor track as an actual sport is actually a lower, is actually a moderate risk sport, but it's the facilities. Uh, there are no facilities available to run indoor track right now because the schools that have indoor track facilities are not going to allow uh, visiting schools. If you've ever seen an indoor track meet, there's three to 400 kids. Uh, there's five or six schools there in those large field houses at Shrewsbury, Wachusett, and Fitchburg. And if you, even if you scaled that back, those schools would be bringing schools that are not even their opponent. They'd be, because they're really host schools. Um, they're just not going to do it right now. And I, and I don't know that they're going to do it during fall too. Um, indoor track might be like an indoor track in fall too, but done on an outdoor track. Like, do the indoor events on an outdoor track. Again, that, that still is very much TBD, but um, that's where indoor track is at at this moment. Boys ice hockey, uh, for I guess the newer members of school committee, um, in the winter we have several co-ops. Boys ice hockey, we're a host co-op. We've been a host with Bromfield ever since the conception of the program. The number next to the school, Bromfield, is eight. And that number indicates the amount of student athletes we would expect to see from Bromfield based on projected numbers. We expect to see about 22 to 24 players for ice hockey. That number is obviously subject to change. We anticipate um, about 14 Littleton student athletes and eight Bromfield student athletes. Most likely this year, there'll be no JV team based on projected numbers and ice time is very scarce. It'd be hard for us to do a real JV program this year anyways. Um, and last year we needed an eighth grade waiver in order to field JV. So all those things considered, we do not anticipate hold, hosting a JV team. Um, we, we think we'll be a varsity only team this year. And we think the makeup of that team will be 14 Littleton, eight Bromfield. Girls ice hockey. We've been fortunate for the last, boy, six, seven, eight years. I'd have to, I could double check that. But we've, we've been fortunate to have an opportunity to, to have our girls play ice hockey with Westford Academy. It's been a great partnership. Um, prior to that, we really didn't have an answer for girls ice hockey that some of the girls would play on the boys team, but clearly it's better for them to play with their own gender. Um, we anticipate six, I, b I believe it's going to be six, not seven of our student athletes um, signed up to play uh, girls ice hockey for Westford Academy this fall, this winter rather. Boys and Girls Swim Dive, another co-op. Uh, we are a guest with Bromfield and Air Shirley. The current plan for, and we, we had based on last year's number, 
I anticipate that number could be as high as nine student athletes from Littleton looking to swim or dive for Bromfield. The current plan for swim dive is to practice by school and hold meets virtually. So my last interaction with the Bromfield AD, the plan is that Littleton would have a practice slot, Bromfield and Air Shirley each would have their own practice slot in the pool. In the meets, all three schools would be together in their own pool and they would score the meet versus another school who's swimming in their own pool. So the meets will not, as of right now, the meets will not be two schools or two programs with it at the same pool. Um, takes away from the, from my, the fun and the excitement of a, of a swim meet, but obviously uh, pools have their own unique set of issues. Boys and Girls Alpine Ski, we've been involved with this one. I think this is year three or year four. For a guest with Lunenburg, we have four student athletes who would be interested in participating in this. However, as of right now, the Alpine Ski may not happen because our home, our home uh, hill slope is Neshoba Valley, and Neshoba Valley at this point has said that they will not be hosting school uh, school races. They will be allowed to train, but not not hold races versus other schools. Lunenburg is looking at um, trying to strike a deal with Mount Wachusett, but Mount Wachusett may also be pulling the plug on it. So again, Alpine ski is very much in the air right now, and, and we're not sure if it's going to happen or not. And the last one is a renewal of a co-op we used to have, which is girls gymnastics. And this, and this one would be a guest with Groton Dunstable. And there are two girls who are interested in this co-op. Um, so, we have a lot of co-op offerings. Um, it's great because we retain a lot of our student athletes who maybe would be interested to a level they might think about another school, but they can go to Littleton High School and um, participate in their preferred sport. This is the only season where we have cooperatives. We don't have any cooperatives in the fall or spring sports. We only have them in the winter sports. Some of the winter sports are very costly. Um, and some of them are very specialized in, in smaller schools. Co-ops are quite common. Um, but I do realize during COVID, uh, co-ops are probably a point of interest. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, last slide. Um, again, the, the first bullet is kind of a large question. What is the LHS participation status for winter? Um, and then middle school basketball, offering some sort of a substitute program. Uh, Mike can maybe touch upon what's going on with Central Mass and rec ball and what kind of opportunities are there for, for below high school students to, you know, in the town. And then uh, obviously any other dialogue. So that was probably a lot of information and I guess now we can talk it through. All right. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. I know there's a tremendous amount of planning involved for this, um, but it sounds like based on what you presented to us tonight and in the past, the fall season was a big success for a lot of different reasons. Um, so I think it's worthwhile for us to give some strong consideration to if we want to continue trying to provide this type of activity level for our student athletes. Um, some unique challenges, indoor versus outdoor, I think is, is something that we need to think about. Uh, and I don't mean little necessarily us as a school, specifically as a school committee, but just the MIAA and the state and everything else. But for the moment, it looks like they are okay with, you know, using the modified uh, rules and play and distancing and no fans, et cetera, et cetera, to at least uh, take a shot at this. Obviously, uh, that the overall metrics are concerning to all of us. Um, but I think that, you know, if we're going to keep school open for in-person learning, I think we can certainly consider uh, if we can support uh, athletics, at least uh, given what we know about the situation right now. Um, at this point, I would ask any school committee members, do you have questions or comments uh, and, and discussion about, is this something that we think we, think we want to support, Matt? Man, I think if we can do it, I know. I mean, safely, I think we got to try. Um, and I think it is really important to the kids to 
have some sense of normalcy in their life. So I would, I would certainly support it. You know, we got to watch obviously the metrics and see what happens, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's nothing like we've seen before in winter sports. So it's not going to be the same, but at least it's something. So if we can do it, I, I'd be supportive of it. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow. Um, I'm, I would support it too. And my senior played soccer this fall and I definitely can tell now that soccer is over, that there's a little bit of a change in her like outlook on things. She was more happy in the fall. So if we can, if we can do this and we can do it safely and we, Put everything in place I think why not try it give these kids something to look forward to this winter because sounds like we're not going to have much of a lot so I would definitely support it mm -hmm. yeah Justin go ahead sure um thanks very much for going through that Mike um one of the things that you mentioned tonight was just the, the daily opportunity for social interaction um around a qualified adult so my and I think that that's so important but my concern really isn't what's going to happen at practice or at game I think it's before and after and if you can just impress upon the coaches and all of your athletes that they really need to be responsible about this because if we if we do have a cluster pop up within a team it, it might not be on it might not be on ice time it might be on the weekend or you know hanging out after school or whatever and we certainly don't want any of that coming into the school or have community spread because that could that could shut everything down. So it is a privilege and um, they need to take this uh, with the utmost seriousness. Um, but the other thing you said last time was there are no do-overs. So these seniors, this might be their last chance to play and we got to give them that chance and they just got to do it. They got to do it responsibly and I'm here to support it. And I just hope that everyone can, uh, can do what's right. So I support it. Thank you, Justin. Right, Brad. Yeah, I share the sentiments of my colleagues. Um, I think this is, is worth supporting as long as we do it safely. Um, and I appreciate your um, thorough um, and informative report, Mike. My question is, is really about going back to what Katrina was talking to us about earlier um, and what's happening with, with towns at the town level. Um, it seems like you have a lot of safeguards in place. What you're doing in the gyms makes a lot of sense, you know, to the details that I'm very impressed with all that. But um, but I'm wondering what the the plans are at the kind of, pod or, or league level, or I think the state designates them as communities with a, not low risk communities, which is a horrible way to phrase it. Um, but towns that have been, you know, in the red for three weeks in a row. And right now we're one week away from it. Um, what are the rules or what will be the guidelines of practices for participation, either if we're going against the team that is in that category, or if we are the team that's in that category? So as we progress through the fall, you know, back in August when we were conceptualizing how this was, how we were going to move forward with fall at fall sports, the, the, the initial plan was, and I think I've heard somebody, I think it was Mike maybe said that the goalposts have moved several times here as far as how COVID is handled within the schools and within communities. Um, we started with, we we're just looking at if a town was a red, that was, you know, that was a problem. But as we progressed through the fall, it became more about, is there a COVID situation in the school? And has there, and we're in constant um, communication. Again, the fall was much easier. It was a six school pod across every sport. Uh, it, it, it was less complex, um, but it was more about, was there um, any risk to playing at the school? Did, they, did the school feel like there was risk to playing or should they not? Um, the only situation we had during the entire fall was at the end of the field hockey season. Um, Tingsboro had a girl on the team uh, test positive and they shut down their team. And essentially it happened at the end of the season. So normally they would have quarantined the team for two weeks and um, then probably tried to resume, but that happened at the end. So it basically shut down their team and they were out of the uh, final part of the season in the playoffs. So um, as far as, our rating and, and, you know, I talk a lot with, uh, during the fall, I had a, a lot of communication with Kelly Clenchy and a lot with John Harrington, um, looking at metrics and really a lot of dialogue in if we were comfortable moving forward or not with our own school or with other schools. Um, and I think we're going to have to go down that road again in the winter. 
Um, and I'll be honest, uh, Kelly has been my resource mainly for uh, keeping on top of COVID. I think, I think um, information comes to the superintendent probably first and foremost. He gets he's the first person to get information regards on how COVID is being tracked or how we're handling it, how Desi's asking us to handling it um, at this point, or Department of Public Health as well. So, and that changed a lot during the fall. So. I don't have a great answer other than that we work together collaboratively and if we're comfortable, we keep moving forward. And if we're not, then we'd either remove ourselves or we might have to say that we're not comfortable playing another school if we felt like they weren't making the right choices regarding um, their practices uh, in relation to COVID. That, I really appreciate that. And that was, I guess, part of my follow-up question. You anticipated it was like Tingsboro seems to have been in the red for a long time. Um, yes. Lunenburg, it seems just got into this category. I guess they are, they're, I hope we're not going to get there, but they're at least one week ahead of us having three in a row. Um, my question was, is this a athletic department decision or is this a school leadership or a district? Um, who's the, who's in the room making decisions about, are we playing these, these teams? And it seems like it's you, Kelly and principal. Is that, um, can you, can you just, I mean, I'm asking for like, this is a, I'm asking for a kind of a toggle um, go, no go switch. But I would like to know about how we anticipate that decisions we made. I can certainly help that help out, Brad. I mean, it, it really is an operational decision. So it, it, we, you know, typically in these situations involve the athletic director, the uh, high school principal, and, and myself. Uh, we may pull in coaches depending on on what the conversation is. But uh, I mean, what we we really want is is to continue to have the safest environment possible for for our students, and, and we all understand that. Uh, our, our students do need some, some sort of activities rather than uh, uh, some of them coming to school in a hybrid model with, with limited interaction. So we were successful in the fall. I mean, this is a different ball game now. It's going to be indoor, but we're going to be watching it very closely. Is that a joke? This is a different ball game? <laughs> you thought that? That's good. <laughs> literally, literally and figuratively. There you go. So I feel really comfortable. Uh, I've, I've, uh, read the minutes of the meetings of, from uh, MIAA and they've done a real thorough job and, and uh, determining whether or not this, this uh, approach that they're taking throughout the state would be safe at this point in time. And I think that's a key statement. These decisions are made with the information that we have right now. Uh, we're, we're gonna continue to monitor it and we may have to make some modifications along the way. Thank you. Excuse me, excuse me for one second. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, it's someone coming to the house who didn't know I was in the meeting. Um, all right, uh, so I think we have a pretty clear consensus, Mike, Lynn, that you know we're, we're ready to move forward. I think that uh, you presented the challenges well and, and the things that you guys are going to be keeping an eye on. I'd like to reiterate that the list you gave was very superficial relative to the overall uh, modifications that are going to be in, used to try to create as safe an environment as possible and re recommend, especially for parents of students that might very well be participating in these activities to take a good look and, 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 and make sure you're familiar with the level of uh, modifications that are taking place uh, in order to make it as safe as possible. Uh, I appreciate Brad's point. I, I think that, you know, we, we we had a good fall season, but I think we were pretty optimistic because the, the numbers were lower and it was outdoors. I think those two things together definitely led to you know, a reasonable amount of optimism that we could get this done. And the fact that, the, unfortunately for the Tingsboro field hockey team, they had to go through that, but it's clear that they, they, people were ready to deal with it when it did happen. The likelihood that there'll be more instances of that type of situation is certainly higher in the winter uh, than, than it would be in the fall, but I think it's worth trying and then we'll just have to see how it goes. I would, you know, I think the direction you're getting from the school committee is that we expect conservative decision-making and, and everybody being at the table and making good decisions about whether it's go or no go on a given day or a given contest or whether it's time to, you know, shut it down for a little while to see if we can get our, uh, reset things and, and move forward. So as long as we're comfortable that that's happening, uh, and you guys illustrated to us that it was happening in the fall, so there's no reason why we wouldn't expect it to continue to happen in the winter. 
um, I think we're, we're, we're good to try it. Mike, I know you had a question about uh, p possibly doing some programming at the middle school level, specifically for basketball. Um, I think we can maybe have you and, and Jason think about uh, seeing what the interest level is, and then we can think about uh, if, it, if it's worthwhile to do or try to do. Um, right now, Littleton Youth Basketball hasn't made any final decisions, but it's looking more and more likely that we the best we're going to do is offer a travel level program that will where games will be played at a central location in Westford at the uh, Millworks facility uh, with limited, if any, practicing during the week in Littleton. We're going to have no weekend basketball, uh, no instructional basketball, no rec basketball in all likelihood, just in order to uh, stay as safe as possible and minimize the use of our school facilities. Um, we typically are in all three gyms uh, pretty constantly on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we're not anticipating that that's going to be the case this year. Um, but I think we can figure out what we want to, what we think might be best for the middle school. I think you guys can uh, uh, work that out. And I, you know, as long as you think you're following the same type of guidelines that we're following for the varsity and JV level competitions, I think that the school committee would be supportive of trying to do some programming at the middle school level, knowing that it would not be interscholastic. We wouldn't be talking about playing games in a pod. It'd really just be, you know, drills and skills with some scrimmaging. Um, but uh, you guys can work that out. All right. Any other questions or thoughts on this? All right. Good luck, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to old business. Kelly, you want to talk about the surveys we have out there for parents, students, and staff to fill out? Sure. Uh, Yesterday, uh, we asked Panorama to uh, send out a reminder to uh, the stakeholders that we've asked to, to fill out the survey. Deadline for the survey is uh, end of tomorrow. Uh, currently, our, our uh, completion rates uh, for the family survey is 28.5%. Uh, so I'd encourage our families to, to look at their email, look at their spam box in case it went in there, and uh, you know, please fill it out. Uh, we really want to find out... Uh, how you're feeling about the various topics that we, we've uh, created the survey for. It's important to us to have that information. So I strongly, strongly encourage you to, to uh, find that survey. It only take five or 10 minutes to fill out. Our uh, staff survey, we have a 55.1% completion rate. Uh, same message to our staff. We want to hear from you. Uh, it's valuable information as we make decisions as to how we're going to move forward. Uh, student survey, they, they win the contest, 90.7% return rate. So. Kudos to our students uh, for uh, filling this survey out. We're looking forward to analyzing those results as well. Actually, I'd, I'd like to interrupt for one second. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, there was a hand raised. I didn't notice it. I'm not sure if this person wanted to talk about the athletics presentation. So uh, Dorothy, can we see what Corey might want to bring forward? Corey Painter, your question, please. Hey everybody, I just wanted to, um, 124 Foster Street, Corey Painter. Um, I would love to fill out that survey. I never received it. It wasn't in my spam. I wrote to the school, didn't hear back. So if I could, you know, if, if there could be, you know, just to check to see if folks are writing in to see if we receive them, that would be awesome. Thanks so much. Corey, uh, if you don't receive it tonight, uh, let me know. Just uh, uh, give, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, I'll have uh, Mrs. Steele make sure that it goes out tonight too. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone. That raises a question though, Kelly, what, is it possible, I don't know what our contract is with the, with the provider that we use to help us form the survey, would it be possible to extend the deadline for the parents? I'm gonna ask Beth to, to uh, come in on this one. Uh, Beth dealt with Panorama far more than I did, so. Yeah, so we can extend the deadline if we choose to. Um, and if we wanna do that because we want a higher participation rate, we can certainly do that. Um, and for, we have received some emails that parents just haven't received them, family members haven't received them. Definitely just um, shoot us an email and I will give you a link and an access code to make sure that you can fill out the, yeah. the form. I, I think it might be worthwhile to think about extending the deadline and maybe making another effort in, instead of waiting for the parents to come back to us to say they didn't get it. If we could push it again, uh, I think it would be worthwhile. 
um, because 28% is a little surprising. So there may be, I don't want to say there was a glitch, but for whatever reason, I think it's worth us trying to make one more effort to get the, the, the level of feedback that we would typically expect from our community who haven't been shy and, and it helps. It's, it's, it's vitally important that we have a good representation of what people are seeing and, and feeling and, and uh, experiencing. Uh, so I think maybe if we could push it out to, even if we just do to the middle of next week, Wednesday, maybe, I think that would help. Sure, we can definitely do that. And one other thing, Chairman Fontanelle, if you don't mind my adding that um, the email went out to one caregiver and it was whoever's listed first in Aspen. Um, so sometimes it's just helpful to have both if there's two caregivers in the household for both of them to look. Um, but we can certainly resend um, and, and extend it. That would be awesome. Thank you. All right. And... Dr. Clinch, you're going to talk about the attestation form? Sure. Uh, we had a, a great return rate uh, from our families with the attestation form. On Monday, looking back, we had uh, 12 families that uh, we had to uh, process. So that's not that bad considering the number of families that we have in our district. So appreciate everybody uh, uh, getting that back to us. Uh, I really am, am hopeful that uh, the extra precaution that we've taken is, is going to pay off. And as Katrina pointed out, it's going to be another week or so before we can, we can determine that. Uh, on that note, uh, uh, we have sent a, a few letters out uh, this week uh, in terms of positive uh, COVID cases. Uh, Thanksgiving was, was a, I guess, created a new paradigm for us in our district. Uh, prior to that, uh, we were only dealing with, with one group, subgroup, uh, We've now entered uh, different subgroups. As a result, we have to be really cautious about making sure that we adhere to HIPAA and FERPA laws as a result. Uh, uh, and, and again, with, with advice and, and uh, recommendation by DESE and, and uh, public health officials, we, we should not uh, differentiate between students and staff. And, and so the letters this week uh, certainly uh, were in line with that thought process. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, we certainly want to make sure we're in compliance with confidentiality and of course, it's just the right thing to do. Confidentiality is, is, is essential in these situations. So I just wanted to mention that at this point in time. All right. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda, we are going to talk again about the MOA that we've been negotiating with the Littleton Educators Association, the LEA. Uh, we have come to a, uh, another tentative agreement, uh, and I'd like to go over the, uh, the MOA, uh, quick presentation. It's very similar to the, the one we did when we took the last vote because really uh, the, the vast majority of the MOA, even though we, we, we didn't support it by a vote, we, we, we agreed by consensus that we supported the vast majority of it. And we just had a tweak uh, the section about whether or not we were gonna go remote during the holiday season. So we can bring up that, that uh, file. Um, this is just, again, a summary. The, the actual MOA will be included in our packets if people want to take a look at it and read through it. It's about a 17-page document. But if we go to the next slide, um, again, it covers topics such as in-person remote learning, instructional workload. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but basically it's a pretty encompassing document that covers a lot of topics related to how we're delivering instruction uh, in our hybrid mode and remotely and how we're maintaining our buildings uh, in terms of trying to keep them as safe as possible. And because it's in, in negotiation and MOA with our union, there's a lot of dialogue in there about, uh, you know, working conditions uh, and how it affects our, our teaching staff. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, again, you know, the, the both groups were committed uh, to two primary goals, providing the best education and teaching possible while uh, facing our challenges and keeping our students, staff and community as safe and healthy as possible. It was a quite an extensive effort that started in the middle of July and went right through into October and November. Uh, we had continuous meetings and communication, both sides presented proposals and responded with counter proposals. And like any negotiation, both sides conceded and compromised and a good faith effort to, to reach this tentative agreement. Uh, in terms of some broad outlines for in-person remote learning and instruction and workload, there's an agreement on uh, 
adherence to assigned schedules for classes, expectations for time on learning, the way we're going to do synchronized and asynchronous instruction and activities, and the availability of teachers to students during the school day. Uh, certain teachers have been assigned to a remote learning program for students who are only participating in remote learning. And we made sure that there was availability of support staff, such as adjustment counselors during the school day for students and families. Uh, one of the key aspects of it was on-site and off-site instruction by LEA members. Uh, on remote learning days, members do have the option of working off-site, contingent on meeting certain criteria. Uh, the administration, however, can require a teacher to work on-site if they feel that teacher is not meeting expectations for delivering remote instruction uh, off-site. Uh, building principals also have the option of having one or more staff members work on-site on Wednesdays, our full remote days. Uh, based on district and student needs, providing that staff are given at least a week's notice for planning purposes. And we may withdraw the option for remote work on Wednesdays if we choose to have in-person learning for students on Wednesdays. In terms of leave time, uh, quarantine or infected staff who are capable will be assigned offsite work and receive pay without the use of their leave days. Uh, there's access and language in there regarding access to some federal programs for uh, individuals who have sick or leave days. Uh, they may also access a sick leave bank prior to exhausting their own individual sick or leave days. Um, they can use their leave at fractional rates to receive compensation that makes them whole relative to the regular per diem rate. And uh, we do uh, have instances where we may provide additional leave days if students or excuse me, staff are supporting uh, students that are on site during remote learning. In terms of social distancing masks and testing in isolation and PPE, uh, we again uh, added in language about the attestation of families and staff. They would adhere to mask guidelines for travel and social gathering during holiday breaks. And if they weren't, then what the requirements would be. Um, we are notifying LEA members when we do have uh, positive COVID cases in our school community. Uh, there's specific language in there uh, adhering to the DESE protocols for masks and mask breaks and availability of face shields and other additional PPE uh, this in maintaining the six feet of distancing. We're doing as much uh, virtual meeting for uh, faculty meetings, professional development and parent meetings as possible. We're limiting our assemblies and fire drills and ALICE training and limiting the use of buildings by outside groups. And we do have protocols and isolation rooms for students and staff who are symptomatic during school hours. In terms of cleaning and hygiene and airflow, we have the, uh, we're running our HVA systems prior to school opening. We've been maximizing the fresh air intake during the good weather. Uh, we're balancing, we balance and measured our HVA systems in October. We'll do so again in December. We agreed to a minimum clean air per CFM uh, achieved through HVAC additional filtering, such as HEPA filters and fresh air. Uh, we have an adherence to cleaning protocols, use of sanitizing misting equipment on two days a week. Uh, regularly scheduled cleaning and stocking and availability of hand sanitizer and disinfectant uh, and a policy for hand washing and sanitation. Uh, we do have, uh, this wasn't negotiated, it's just something that we decided was worthwhile. We are adding HEPA filters to all our classrooms. Those are being rolled out now. It was a pretty big order of over 200 units uh, and we're, we're receiving them, you know, day by day and then getting them out into the classroom. So that's an ongoing, it will be done uh, hopefully soon, but certainly before the, uh, we get back from the winter break. Okay, go to the next slide. Pretty sure there's more. Should be eight. And I get it. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Let me check, Mark. Yeah, I'm just checking my own my version of the document on my computer. Hold on. Oh, maybe that was it. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was it. <laughs> um, 
So those are the, the, the a broad outline. Again, the, the actual text of the overall MOA is, is complete in our packet. Um, school committee members were given this earlier this week to review. Uh, at this point, our expectation is to have a discussion and then entertain a motion to uh, ratify this agreement. The LEA has already had their membership vote on it and, and they did ratify it. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to get that done as well tonight. At this point, I would ask if there are any Questions or input from the school committee or discussion on this? Yep, Brad, go ahead. I just want to say thanks to, to you and Matt for, for taking the lead in negotiations on our team and thanking the LEA for their persistence and advocacy too. I think it's a good agreement. All right. Anybody else? No, I mean, that's fine. You know, like I say, the, the vast majority of this is something we, we talked about a few weeks ago and, and we're at, you know, pretty uh, straightforward consensus on um, really it was just one issue that was resolved through a six, uh, you know, more negotiation. Appreciate the LEA's understanding on that. And uh, we got there. Um, so if there is no other further discussion at this point, I will entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the updated MOA. Second. Motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All right, hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Timolin? Timolin Rossi, yes, yes. And Mike Fontanella votes yes as well. So thank you for that. We've ratified that MOA. All right. And at this point is a second uh, option uh, opportunity for input from interested citizens. We're getting close to the end of the meeting. So if there's anybody that has anything they'd like to bring up for the school committee, now is your, about your last chance to do it for this evening. And I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we'll move down into subcommittee reports, PMBC. I have nothing to report. I wasn't at the meeting. Okay. Uh, how about the budget subcommittee? Uh, we met this week um, and uh, gave the go ahead to present the the numbers to the, the finance committee, or, or sorry, the finance director. Okay, very good. Uh, how about uh, policy subcommittee? We're planning on um, meeting next week. Okay, great. All right. Uh, Mike, if, if I have one more thing, if, if uh, yep. I, I could bring it up. Uh, back on, I believe, September 10th, uh, Beth and I talked about uh, our plan this year for uh, working with our staff on uh, PD uh, specific to equity and cultural proficiency. And uh, it might be a good time to do an update because uh, we've been doing a lot since then. We, we actually hired a uh, yeah, presenter, Dr. Warnham, who uh, does this for many different organizations, uh, very successful, very engaging. So we've offered three PD sessions uh, with our, our staffs and, and they've been very interactive and, and focused on, on a lot of reflection in conversation. And, and we really believe that in order for our, our staff to have difficult conversations in regard to equity, racial equity, et cetera, they need to, to be comfortable having those conversations and having conversations with each other, with, with uh, uh, somebody guiding them through it, uh, I, th I feel has been very productive and, and is going to get us in a, a better spot to have those conversations, uh, not only with our students, but with our broader community when we're ready to do so. Our leadership team also took a course uh, with Dr. Warnham together. I really enjoyed that. It was nice getting together and, and uh, actually taking the course together. We have one more class left and uh, some very rich dialogue and, and from a leadership point of view, it really focused on how do we, how do we create that environment and, and, and culture that uh, really celebrates uh, the concept of equity and, and cultural diversity. Uh, our next step is to form an equity team uh, within our district at the district level. Uh, I've already talked to Dr. Harrington, or we've talked to Dr. Harrington more correctly. And uh, we're encouraging uh, a couple of staff to uh, reach out to our students in a volunteer forum setting and, and start, start conversing back and forth in terms of, you know, what, what does cultural proficiency mean? What does it mean to you? And, and what about equity? So we're, 
we're moving forward with that. We're, we're going to continue to bring Dr. Warren back in, in various venues. I envision when we're ready to do so, uh, hopefully partnering with the town and, and having a community forum uh, and having a panel. And uh, I know Brad and I had a conversation about that the other day. I think Brad would be a, an excellent uh, panelist, so to speak, uh, because in order for us to continue to move forward with these initiatives, uh, we really need to do this as a community. I mean, we do a lot at the school level, but in order to, to make a long lasting difference, it's gonna require community involvement as well. Beth, do you have anything you'd like to add to that or? No, I think you, you rounded it out pretty well. I, the one thing um, is what's been really nice with Dr. Warnham is that our whole district, all staff um, and, and admin team have been provided with common vocabulary, which really allows us to move forward with this. So it's been nice to have that. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Brad, yep, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I just, I really appreciate the update and thanks uh, Beth and Kelly for the leadership here. This is such an important topic for all school districts, but especially this year um, in our climate. Um, so keep up the good work. Uh, yeah, I think maybe it might be worthwhile once we, you guys have gotten through the coursework and, and, and had a chance to integrate it into the work you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis, it might be worthwhile to have a presentation uh, that, you know, to the school committee and the community that gives us a better idea of how this is being actioned uh, in, the, in the district on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. All right, thank you. All right, are there any other business before the school committee? I don't think we have any, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made it seconded. I'll take a roll call. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Timlin? Timlin Rossi, yes, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy and Dave from LCTV and Bettina and Dorothy for helping out to support us. And we'll see you guys all soon. Thank you.